Welcome to part 10. In, in order to really understand about all this business with a false Israel and its plan and a sacrifice and the remnant, the special elect, special select are taken away to this place, the moon, Shinar. So an interesting thing today that kind of reminds me of something I said possibly a few days earlier. Might have been a week earlier, I'm not sure. But I said something that you'll probably see the names of these ships that can do this inner space travel. You know, basically going from here to the moon that would reflect the philosophy, the figurative symbols of these scriptures. And on CNN, on the news, I saw them talking about Justin Bieber being selected with Aston Kusher to go on some sort of commercialized inner space uh, journey on one of these commercial space flights that are planned for, you know, open to the public in the future. Well, you should all know that that's the technology that is already developed, that is already capable and it's going to do exactly that. It's going to take these special select ones to this location. And the name of it is called uh, Virgin Galactic. Virgin Galactic. Now remember, Ishtar is simultaneously the virgin and the whore. So what makes her the whore is that from her inception by Israel originally intended as the virgin the vessel as the church the church virgin the representation of the spiritual peoples of god you know israel failed at that trust so by taking israel other lovers as it's termed philosophically here and figuratively in the bible israel thy mother becomes the whore this is the manifestation of israel's ishtar's persona figurative image of this whore that we see later riding the beast because she's become self-righteous she's become materially minded and that's still in representation to the jews to this day they're still considered highly material obsessed with money now that's not my opinion but it is to seems to be the world norm that's associated with this modern jewish culture well, in reality, it stems from the understanding of how commercial Babylon, a.k.a. the materialism of ecclesiastical Babylon. So if you see ecclesiastical Babylon as the woman that's become the whore now, well, what she's been decked with is all this material lavishness by her new lover. And that would be the fallen prince. That would be Inky. So philosophically, we begin to form a better image of this understanding of Babylon, the great mystery as the original inception of Israel, thy mother, until she was corrupted upon the lines of the serpent wisdom that has now associated her with the sacred feminine, where Israel, in a sense, is the product of the birthing of these heifers that are so often talked about in scripture, and we're also going to see it here. Those are the female cows. Now, the philosophical image of commercial Babylon now as being the only thing that's going to be destroyed is what the ten kings are seeking to do. In other words, the ten horns, northern Israel. They have purposely decked her with materialism to create this spiritual corruption within the land that we all ourselves find ourselves living within. The spiritual corruption being the materialism is now, now all passed on to us as the material environment material Babylon, which has been created purposely by ecclesiastical Babylon. So now philosophically, esoterically, they plan to destroy the commercial portion of this harlot that now they have used to create the inception of the fallen prince. So the corruption of her with the materialism, the decking of her with the lavishness and the luxury is the very same thing that you see some man might do to try to 
get himself a woman or a wife or even pull a woman or a wife from her husband, just as we see it's going to be portrayed romantically in the book of Hosea. So to understand Israel's role more deeply, thy mother Israel, as she involves into this commercial Babylon that has been tempted with this commercialism, as we see the material knowledge, which is displayed to us as the deception in which we all live in, purposely by the powers that be, uh, we need to understand a little better about the roots of Israel. And this connection in Zechariah is going to open it up so that we can move forward into Hosea and see these comparisons from Revelation chapter 12. Once again, this woman Israel, ecclesiastical Babylon, now being divested of her commercialism, a.k.a. what we see symbolized as New York, she's leaving behind that apple, which is going to reflect further to other scriptures in Jeremiah. And then now they bring her up as this whore that's ready to give birth. They've basically used her. And then this is why we'll see in scriptures later that this calf of Samaria is going to be the fallen prince. The calf, he's the golden child that they're going to bring forth. We're going to see the scripture that's going to say that he's going to cast them off. He's going to even cast them off. And we're going to see that he who kills with the sword is going to be killed with the sword. So it's going to be interesting. It's uh, a pretty intact interpretation of this connection with Babylon being double, both ecclesiastical, spiritual, and both commercial, and then the image of her decked in the pearls and the lavishness, even that purple, as you see, which is now all being displayed to you, you know, all over the place. Everybody's about the purple, but they don't really tell you what the true meaning is. That purple is signifying their coming kingdom, and at the same time, the destruction of this material kingdom in itself. So, looking at the story of Joshua, we got to realize that Joshua is a high priest of Israel. Not only is a high priest of Israel, but he is a high priest of Israel from the tribe of Ephraim. So if you can understand this connection with Ephraim being the leader of the northern ten tribes and being known and seen as Israel itself, this interpretation from Hosea that's going to connect to Revelation chapter 12 is going to make perfect sense. In other words, we're going to see other another interpretation of Israel going to the moon, not only from Rev 12, from what we see here in Zechariah, but also what we see in Hosea. Hosea is going to really open it up with a deeper understanding with who this Israel is as she's connected with this whorish mother now that now gives credibility to everything that I've told you about the Bible being double and there's two gods. You will understand exact confirmation by what the Bible means when it says that this Israel is now the whore. For her to be a whore, she's taken another husbandman. That another husbandman is Inky the fallen prince. And then thus we have the sacred feminine that is born from that, which is really all a deception, the trickery to bring them in. So let's understand Joshua here a little bit. As you see, Satan is there ready to take possession the angel of the Lord, a.k.a. Michael, forgives Joshua and replaces his dirty and filthy garments, we know with that clean remnant, and then promises him a place to walk amongst those before him. In other words, these angels in heaven. So now we, we get a fuller understanding of why in the world is Satan there seeking to take possession of Joshua. And you got to remember the original promise of God after this takes place with their whoredom, God promises to eventually restore and redeem them. And then that's why we understand how I see it with Jesus Christ's perfection, where he is not going to lose a single one. But the story gets a little bit more deeper in its variables about how that plays out. So anyway, now, as you know that, you know, let's look at Joshua here and just see the confirmation. Um, basically, I'll let you read this for yourself here. And then I'll read you this. Joshua was born in Egypt during the period of slavery. He was a member of Ephraim, the important tribe that later formed the heart of, northern, of the northern kingdom of Israel. 
Now, Joshua was Moses' servant. He was on the mountain when Moses received the law. And then, which you know, the story goes on later that Moses is wroth with them because in reality, he's trying to teach them the doctrine that they all are these golden calves. And then we know the connection with the manna now, which is connected to the monatomic gold and that temple of Hathor, which is going to come up in a figurative manner here shortly with the symbolism for the cow and the heifer. You'll see it being identified with Ephraim. So now the mystery of Joshua being from the tribe of Ephraim associated with the northern ten tribes who has committed whoredom with this Israel is not hard to see and imagine why Satan is there to claim the body. So please don't miss the significance of this titled angel of the Lord, which is a distinct manifestation of God himself, per the strongest concordance, is pardoning and forgiving sin. And throughout the book of Jude, or in the book of Jude, we see that this angel of the Lord is clarified as Michael. And the very same event is taking place with Moses' body. Now you should understand Moses as being this leader, this spiritual leader of Israel. Even he himself was deceived and we see that he is lifting up the serpent staff, the caduceus, the symbol for the Leviathan, the symbol for Inki, that you yourself can Google if you'd like to see that confirmation. We've got other sources, Sumerian sources will tell you the same. That's the crooked serpent that Leviathan is talking about. It also represents the sine wave, which represents the air waves and anything that is passing through the medium of air in other words sound or light vibration and you know that satan is the chief of the powers of the air of the air waves this this understanding produces this greater depth when you see that the proclamation about satan being connected with these airwaves is really now that symbol for the sine wave it's the same thing it all takes a symbol as it passes through so should be no no mystery here so the connection is is that joshua is of the tribe of ephraim exclusively the leader of the northern ten tribes who their symbol is the unicorn so now let us uh get a more clear understanding of what's about to take place. I'm going to read it here, and I know the print's pretty small, but please listen close. This is where we're going to see a different take on, uh, on this vision of Israel going to the moon, and this vision of Israel that completes Ezekiel chapter 19, and the vision of Israel that completes uh, Revelation chapter 12. So, listen to the opening here. Hosea was a contemporary of Amos in Israel and of Isaiah and Micah in Judah. And his ministry continued after the first, or Assyrian, captivity of the northern kingdom. His style is abrupt, metaphorical, and figurative. Israel is Jehovah's adulterous wife, repudiated, but ultimately to be purified and restored. This is Hosea's distinctive message, which may be summed up in his two words, Lo Ami, not my people, and Ami, my people. Israel is not merely apostate and sinful, that is said also, but her sin takes its character from the exalted relationship in which she has been brought. The book is in three parts, the dishonored wife, Israel, that same Israel that we see completing her dishonor by producing this great work, this fallen prince, as we saw, Revelation 12, confirmed by Zechariah, the story of the Ephah. I'm sorry if I pronounced that miscorrectly. It says, the dishonored wife, the first, the second, the sinful people, Israel itself, 
Third, the ultimate blessing and glory of Israel, of which you know Jesus Christ is perfect. He declares not to lose a single one. Now that is spiritually meant. There is going to be physical destruction as we are beginning to understand there are two fires that come and we are going to see that Israel is going to have to go through a little suffering of its own making and it's going to be understood in a unique way. It's going to be pretty incredible. Israel is going to be killed physically and take take on its own suffering that it seeks to induce on others. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. That sword that they will be killed with is the same sword represented in Isaiah chapter 34. That is that sacrifice that takes place in these figurative um, places that are deemed as the land of Adume or the peoples of Adume and then that land of Basra. We know that Basra was unique for having the world's largest buildings in the Iron Age. Of course, New York City has been always in competition and at various times held that title for having the world's largest buildings. Also, all the other things that connect us there, Golgotha, City of the Dead, you know what I'm saying, guys. Now see this. Understand. Understand. Israel is an adulterous wife. This is what makes her take on that feminine identity that will connect her now to the daughter of Babylon. Her adultery is to this fallen prince known as Inki who tempts with this material knowledge that develops into the, the commercial portion, the material portion of ecclesiastical Babylon. As you know, ecclesiastical Babylon is represented as the woman that rideth the beast. This beast has ten horns. These ten horns represent these ten kingdoms, northern Israel. Now, the beast itself, we know, is the representation of the dragon, which is the fulfillment of Lucifer, Satan, and the devil. And we know that the devil is the prince of this world seeking that material form. The whore herself, the interpretation as Israel being the adulteress, is now decked in this material manner, just as you know, Israel itself is depicted as being materially obsessed. Israel is supposed to be connected as the bankers. They're supposed to be connected with the banking system. This Zionist state is all about commercialism, but at the same time, it's converting this commercialism as the power and the resources solely within their hands. So Israel itself now being associated once again as the adulterer and the feminine takes on the manifestation of this whore Ishtar, daughter Babylon. If Sin is the Babylonian moon god, you will find that Ishtar, in some accounts, ancient accounts, even very popular accounts, that she is considered the daughter of the moon, completing the understanding of being the daughter of Sin, in other words, the daughter of Babylon, which now she's only been tempted to create this state of confusion and distortion and material lust that we see the peoples of this world are now obsessed with now that they've been encompassed and entrapped, encased in this materialism. That now the nations of the world are all induced as being represented by northern Israel itself that has fallen to this fallen knowledge. Now, at the same time that we see Northern Israel being represented now as ecclesiastical Babylon, this whore and the commercialism, you see why now the fire from the sky is aimed at the symbolic New York, which represents its symbolic commercialism. That is all the product of the apple that was originally offered as temptation to man. So we see that the outward man that is living in the subconstruct of their reality, which they consider the sheeple, is now all uh, proffered, offer, offered and subjected and subduced and given all of this materialism. This represents the deceptive act of the serpent as he offers in the book of Enoch, we see the daughters of men that were selected that were fair. They're the only ones that are offered the spiritual knowledge. And then they offer all of the other portions of mankind of which they put in subjection under these kings that are born from these daughters who eventually turn into what we perceive as the Illuminati that are connected as these ten horns known as the unicorns, each one of them as a sovereign nation, but yet are united as one mind to one cause. So 
Israel itself now is seeking, as we saw in Revelation chapter 17, verse 17, to destroy the commercial portion of ecclesiastical Babylon, a.k.a. the materialism, which is now represented by our current subconstruct that they have us all bound in. But they've used this current subconstruct to strictly produce the confusion, which has given them the upper hand. Why? so that they could continue their great labor unaware to us and then use all of our resources and manpower to dedicate the system towards their goal. Now that the system has achieved their goal, they no longer need the system. They no longer need the induction of the commercialism and they seek to sacrifice that portion of her of which we are all bound in. And this is why Jesus Christ continually admonishes you that once this material tabernacle fades, you will fade with it if you yourself are not yet walking in the spirit. So even though they can bring down the material and bring down this material tabernacle with the sacrifice, the subconstruct reality that we ourselves are all dwelling in, if we ourselves recognize the spirit, the higher form and stay centered, there's nothing that they can basically do to us. Now in the physical, they can. If you're in the path of immediate destruction, any other way that you yourself are still seeking to maintain survival. So in this destruction that they seek to bring upon commercial Babylon, ecclesiastical Babylon, now that she's been induced as this whore, which has been used only to produce this bastard child known as the fallen prince into a material form through their occult sciences, once they rid her of the materialism, the luxuries, the jewels, everything that she's decked and arrayed in, aka the materialism that's symbolized by New York City, then she herself is taken to the moon to be kept there for a time and a time and half a time. There she is nourished for a little while. We'll see that confirmation here in Hosea as it's confirmed further in Zechariah. goes all the way back to Revelation chapter 12. So as they sacrifice the commercial Babylon portion of her, they want you to believe that with this sacrifice, the other Babylon itself in full is taken care of. And then that's what's going to be presented as the Catholic Church, aka Christianity. They want you to believe that that's all a part of it and going with it. And they will produce Catholicism being dismantled with it. But at the same time, they're going to try to create the disciples of Jesus Christ as having something to do with Catholicism, of which in reality they do not. If you're a true disciple of Jesus Christ, you recognize the difference in these two understandings of theological, spiritual points of view. So this Catholicism ends up being Rome, which you know is further connected back to the symbol of the eagle, which is further now connected to United States, the English Ephraim, which now the eagle itself will translate from Hebrew back to a vulture, which will bring us to a consistent understanding that Ephraim itself has come out of the land of Egypt, hence the symbol for the vulture, which is revered in Egypt for its connection to this transfiguration from death to life. Now, uh, all of that I said fast, and I'm sorry. If you could go back maybe and listen to it again, and keep in mind there are two Babylons, one ecclesiastical meaning spiritual, religious, mystery Babylon, the mystery religions. She has been decked in a commercial materialism that has really just been offered as a subconstruct for the sheeple to dwell in. They plan to destroy the sheeple within it while we're captive within this Babylon. And of course, there are prophets and seers who are always sent to bring you out before this takes place. And that's, that's the main goal. I'm going to tell you, that's the main goal, to bring as many out as we can. So now, let me go ahead and read this down here, keeping in mind... What you know about Israel in Rev 12, even what you know about Israel, the woman, thy mother Israel, in Ezekiel 19, who is subducing the lions, teaching them to be predators, and she is a blood vine, and then eventually she's planted in that dry and thirsty ground. We're going to get to that. Um, this is important here. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to try to read this clearly. 
remember the beginning here about the two proclamations of what this Hosea is about. Not my people, meaning Israel, and then they become his people. And then this will help you understand that a little better. My people is an expression used in the Old Testament exclusively of Israel, the nation. It is never used of the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Israel and Hosea means the ten tribes forming the northern kingdom as distinguished from Judah, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, forming the southern kingdom which adhered to the Davidic family. The promise of verse 10 awaits fulfillment. And that's right, it is awaiting fulfillment to this day. Israel has not been restored. Israel does not have its kingdom in place. Their thousand year kingdom has not reigned. And what we find out in Hosea, the true restoration is a kingdom without end, which nullifies what Revelation teaches in another place that describes that their kingdom will last for a thousand years and the serpent's loose. Well, that is in direct contradiction to what happens to the serpent, that dragon, by being cast into that lake of fire and being utterly consumed forever. So therefore, the serpent, the dragon, cannot be released again, which would be consistent with the truth of what we'll see here in Hosea, that when Israel is truly restored, Israel is restored to a kingdom everlasting, not a thousand year reign. That's the false reign that is being promised by this false prince. So, as we say here, my people is an expression used in the Old Testament exclusively of Israel and nation is never used of the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Israel and Hosea means the ten tribes forming the northern kingdom as distinguished from Judah. Now, so important, Israel means the northern ten tribes. Who leads them? Ephraim. Where did we see Joshua was from? Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim. Joshua being from the tribe of Ephraim, it's not hard to understand how Joshua, as I said, his body was sought to be possessed, his soul sought to be possessed by Satan. And there we saw the angel of the Lord, Michael, was forgiving his sins and was restoring him with, with the clean Ramit because he had filthy garments. Now you understand why these garments are filthy because the greater understanding with Moses in the wilderness bringing them to Sinai, in other words, the mountain of sin, the shining one, is all to expose them to this doctrine of the understanding that they themselves are gods. And it's an extension of the serpent doctrine that is connected to the serpent wisdom, which is connected to the architecture in the Temple of Solomon that encoded within that architecture is the code for the new man in which we see and should see later in some other videos how that's going to connect to the temple of Baalbek and if you were to look at the temple of Baalbek from an overhead view you would see that it looks like a man holding a key and this connects us to Solomon's key there's an incredible connection between Solomon's temple and the temple of Baalbek the cedars of Lebanon incredible it's facing the sky it's facing the moon we're going to see that the solomon's temple was even termed and is classified in the hebrew bible as zion and then this zion as i said being the temple of solomon is really all about encoding how to create this temple body of the fallen prince into a material form how to create this God man, which is really the great secret of the great work to bring him into material form. So the whole story about the wisdom in this house, the serpent wisdom of Solomon with the two columns, this two polarities, how they work it, how the Leviathans are needed to go up and down, up and down, white to black, black to white, good to evil, friend to foe. It's all the same story here. It's all the same story. So... We see that three things are going to take place, but it's going to come down to the story of them going to the moon told to us in a different way. So let's, uh, let's move forward and just keep in mind that Israel, these 10 northern tribes, is not his people, but the perfection of Jesus seeks to make him, make them, make Israel, make her, redeem and restore her. Okay? 
So in order to understand that and understand all that stuff that I just told you about Babylon, listen closely here once again. That Israel is the wife of Jehovah, now disowned, but yet to be restored, is the clear teaching of the passages. This relationship is not to be confounded with that of the church to Christ. In the mystery of the divine triunity, both are true. The New Testament speaks to the church as a virgin espoused to one husband, which could never be said of an adulterous wife restored in grace. Israel, Jehovah's earthly wife, the church, the Lamb's heavenly bride, the true virgin. Now we see that Israel is not who they're depicting themselves to be on all these YouTube videos that are promoting Israel in its traditions, in its doctrines, in its prophets that were calling fire down from the sky to destroy men. It's all being shown to you guys in a deceptive manner. So this fulfills this understanding where Israel has become... A, an adulterous wife, she is manifested into the form of Ishtar. But as I tell you, they have used this as a medium. These high, wicked ones in high places really don't give a hoot about Israel at all. It's Jesus Christ who does. And we'll see later on in these scriptures how this calf of Samaria, a.k.a. Inky, the one that they create with their hands, that it's going to say it, is going to even cast them off. He's going to even eventually reject them, the very ones that brought him about. I'm telling you, this guy is going to come in like the greatest thing since sliced bread to some people. And then he's going to truly show himself for what he is because something happens. And when this thing happens by their own lack of knowledge, by their own miscalculations, then it causes his fury to be aroused and he begins to show his true image. And that's of this beast that he has transformed himself into by coming into a carbon animal vessel body, a material animal vessel body. Man is a creature created by God. A creature is an animal. In Ecclesiastes, we will see that that is successfully translated just as I said it. So, as we move forward here, you can easily see now that it's not the true church that's being redeemed and taken away to the moon. Okay? It's the whore that has been used to produce this bastard child. And as I told you, the sacrifice is to, to remove her of this materialism and these luxuries of which we ourselves, as I said, in this commercialism, this materialism, we ourselves are bound within this subconstruct of reality known as the matrix. Notice this is a subconstruct. It's not the, um, it's not the actual reality but it is the sub construct. It's the lesser, the regressor. It's beneath the waterline. It's where you're drowned in to survive because you have not yet, yet recognized that you're already eternal and that the promise is already there. All you have to do is take it and then the joy can begin regardless of what they do. Um, we're still going to be all all right, plain and simple. So, all right, you've got that. You've got that into perspective. There's a whole lot here. Let's just remember uh, this real quick. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereas she hath said, These are my rewards. My lovers hath given me, and I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. That's the fulfillment of what we saw with Ishtar, that great owl, in Isaiah chapter 34. This is where this land, once it's been, once it's been destroyed, then she seeks to take it over, the vines, the thistles grow in, and then all the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, they all come in to inhabit it. Um, we see that ecclesiastical Babylon, meaning Ishtar, is not Israel. It's just this mystery part of her that, she's, that Israel itself has been subjected to. So the Ishtar portion the creeping ivy of her that has overgrown the true temple of her understanding is what's going to be 
taken away. Okay, so when this mother and I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereas she has said, that's the representation of Ishtar itself, the ecclesiastical um, image of what has seduced um, these early peoples of our spiritual past. So a good way to put it, I would say. Now, as you can see here, more confirmation. Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. So I'm telling you, it's not Israel itself, because Israel can't be destroyed if it's to be restored. So it's the ecclesiastical portion. It's, it's the occult that has bound Israel into this vicious cycle this vicious ritual that has been all about producing metaphysically, esoterically, and now finally materially, this, this fallen spirit into our realm. Now, as we, this is just important here. You've got to see this, how this begins to play out, how Israel is going to be destroyed by its own folly. It's not, it's not God that is going to destroy Israel. When we talk about two fires coming from the sky, it's still God wants mercy. But they're trying to imitate what they want you to believe is a natural event associated with this Nibiru that's going to bring this destruction upon us. That's why all that's being pumped out. All of that's being pumped out for that specific reason so that they can cover up this deception, this miracle fire from the sky that we see in Rev 1313 that Ephraim is going to impose, the leader northern Israel is going to impose from the moon. Now, as I said, that there is already a portion of Israel there that has prepared the place to bring the remnant about. That's why we see the remnant that goes, that is being, that is being restored in Revelation, Ephraim is not counted, neither is Dan. Because Ephraim is already there. So Ephraim doesn't need to be sealed. Literally, Ephraim is already going to be at the moon at this point. And then the rest of the 12 tribes come along because Ephraim is the 13th. So if you check out in Revelation where we see the restored of Israel, the remnant of Israel that's been redeemed, the supposed ones. It's really not. It's false Israel that's trying to get away from this destruction that they've imposed upon us. Right? So... That's why 12 tribes are mentioned. Ephraim is not in it. Neither is Dan. Dan is still sealed and is about to appear as the judge, as the locust. And then, as I said, Ephraim is not in that remnant because guess what? They own the moon. They're the ones that have prepared the place for the remnant to come to. <clears throat> All right, so here's how the story breaks down with Hosea. Um, I'm going to try to speed this along here. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They're not destroyed by Jesus. Okay, as I told you that this secondary fire from the sky is a twofold understanding once again. It is going to be associated with a natural occurrence with the cycle of the current solar system as it is associated with particular orbital disturbances that have happened in the long time distant past by this binary star system that is associated with the planet Nibiru. It's not that Nibiru, the planet associated with the dwarf star, is not real. It's just the threat that it brings to us personally is not what they're presenting to you. And it's certainly not the homeland of the Anunnaki for incredible reasons that have everything to do with moons and gravitation and physical anatomy. Beings from another place like that, where the gravity is so great, could not survive on this world. You know that from the understanding of the dinosaurs and the collapse of the atmospheric pressure. Brontosauruses and the such could not survive. Pterodactyls could not be suspended in their density of matter because the atmosphere was no longer dense enough to support these creatures. The same thing takes place with these supposed Anunnaki just supposedly popping off from another planet that is associated with the dense gravity of a dwarf star and that is even associated with an extreme cold that doesn't have no light. None of this makes sense. So they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes and make you believe these beings are coming from there when in all actuality, they've been materialized here. They've been materialized here from their spirit forms sent to do this spirit work and they have they have failed at that trust. So there's much more to that story there, but back to the subject, they are destroyed by their own lack of knowledge, not by God. 
when God brings what is termed an association with the second fire, as I call it, notice in Revelation that he simply gathers the sons of perdition associated with the symbols of the dragon and cast them into the lake of fire. We'll really cast the singular one, the beast, into the lake of fire because we see that the two others, Lucifer and Satan, the association of the other two of the Trinity of LSD are already been bound. And that's what I've told y'all guys before. These two beings are already been bound. That's why all of the focus has been continually on this fallen prince because he is the one that is a part of this world's proclamation of this sevenfold times 70 generation time period that we see imposed in Genesis. It's the very same time period for a short time of these 70 generations and this is what we're about to see take place. So coming to the end of this, now the righteous judgment can be effective for the planetary prince of this world because he is associated with the matters of this world exclusively. Satan could go upon the other stones of fire, meaning the other planetary suns, the other solar systems. We know that Lucifer was the system sovereign, which means he is the chief lieutenant over this portion of the galactic. He is also a son of God known as a morning star, of which he also has an inheritance. He also has a creation where he has been created as a minister and a manager over a large portion of the solar system. He's failed at his trust. He's induced Satan as his first lieutenant. Satan becomes the false prophet, and he begins to go on inducing all of these other planets into rebellion, of which our planet is one. Now the planetary prince, being a part of the trust of this planet, is a part of the sealing of this planet, which was sevenfold times 70 generations, which is roughly 40,000 years. Thus, Inky's number is 40. And that's where we get the start, starting point for uh, Eden is 36,288 BC. That's when this sealing begins to take place. That's when these beings begin to take unto themselves the daughters. And then that's where in Enoch, they say, Samyeza and Azazel, they know what's going to happen. And they tell them that, hey, all of you better realize what's about to go down. If we do this, um, we're going to be bound for a long time. But if, if we succeed, that's when they believe that they're going to inherit the dominion of this world and they can maintain their dominion, their uh, immortality in the flesh because they've been kicked out of heaven, a.k.a. the spiritual boat. They've got nothing left. So, incredibly, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, not by Jesus, because thou hast rejected knowledge. Now, it's a lot for me to remember as we talk about this, but... <sighs> The fire that they're going to suffer a little while is not going to be the fire that they bring upon us as the second cup, which is going to be artificial that they create. The fire that they're going to suffer is going to be, as I said, a part of the natural occurrences of the solar system that are associated with particular other space bodies that have been perturbed by the magnetic disturbances of the orbital distortion of the original binary star that is to our sun. As I said, it's not that it's out there. So there will be something that takes place from a distance that this thing has other things that have had altered orbits on the periphery of its orbit. And then this is where we'll get this connection that the Bible calls this fire from the sky and the hailstones that's going to eventually destroy in a sudden destruction their kingdom, their supposed golden age, their thousand year reign. They're going to be killed with the very same sword that they try to destroy us with. And this is going to be based on their lack of knowledge, their miscalculations. That's right. They're going to miscalculate these celestial events and prophecies and not realize that what they're trying to fake is going to happen in a particular manner here. But you're going to see that that the Spirit of Truth is going to talk about actually still saving the true remnant and the church from this secondary fire 
but not from the first fire. They're going to be asked to go through this first fire and to pass through this with their temptation unscathed. In other words, which will produce them as that pure virgin bride through this temptation and, and, and bring them safely to the other side. Now, when I say that, I mean in a spiritual manner, but we know that some of these people will not see a physical death before the return of the Lord and his glory, which means many people are going to survive this thing physically. And I pray that each and every one of you are a part of that number. Even these people that come against me, because I really don't have anything against you guys at all. It's just that I'm just real fed up with what you've been doing. I know what it's about. I know what you guys think that you're right. I don't have no problem with it. Think that you're right all that you want. I got faith that I'm right also. So it goes on to explain their calamity from this lack of knowledge. It says, I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest of me. Remember Joshua, Israel, Ephraim was the priest. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore, will I change their glory into shame, their glory. Remember, they're supposed to inherit that kingdom. That's the glory that we see Jacob prophesizing for Ephraim in the last days. They eat up the sin of my people, and they set their heart on their iniquity, meaning they're setting their hearts content on producing the iniquity of God's people. And there shall be like people, like priests, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their doings. This is false Israel, the ten northern kingdoms of Israel that is even further associated with these secret societies. It says, for they shall eat and not have enough. This is in the connection to what's going to happen to them and their miscalculations, even what's going to happen to them with their food stores and water stores on the moon. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. Now that can be interpreted in two ways. They have left off to take heed to the Lord. They have left off to take heed to the true father. They have gone away from him and become the whore or they have left off to take heed to this other Lord, of which we'll see will be proclaimed in other portions here. Very important, guys. This is where we're going to come up to a key scripture. Thanks, everybody, for hearing me out. Um, really do. I know that these videos get a little long. Let's move forward. My people ask counsel at their stocks. <laughs> at their stocks. Incredible. New York Stock Exchange. And their staff declareth unto them, their staff, remember the staff that Moses lifted up, this serpent wisdom, this serpent wisdom is the thing that declareth unto them. For the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err, and they have gone a whoring from under their God. The spirit of Ishtar, this seduction of the sacred feminine, the seduction of these ancient gods, um, these demigods that were produced as the Nephilim from the daughters of men. They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains. Verse 13, Revelation chapter 13, verse 13. And burn incense upon the hills under oaks and poplars and elms. Because the shadow thereof is good. The shadow agents, the shadows of Ishtar. Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom. And your spouses shall commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery. For themselves are separated with whores, and they sacrifice with harlots. Therefore, the people that doth not understand shall fall. Once again, this God, the spirit of mercy, the spirit of truth, is declaring that even the peoples of this land, therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom. Your spouses shall commit whoredom. The peoples of this land of Israel that they have seduced into this materialism purposely to keep us down so that they can eventually control us and overtake us to produce this, what they know we would have not wanted into this world. So this God, the spirit of truth, representation of the spirit of Jesus Christ, says, I'm not going to punish your daughters. In other words, you're the peoples of the land that you have put and separated unto this deception. I'm not going to punish them. You get that? So the punishment that Rev 13 is trying to bring and the supposed punishment of the Elijah fire being the fulfillment of Rev 13, 13, that ain't coming from the father. And you can see it right here. You can see it coming from the spirit that Hosea is in touch with. 
I would not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery. Yes, are separated with whores. They're separated with whores. They sacrifice with harlots. They don't even realize it. Therefore, the people that doth not understand, they don't realize it, they shall fall. Once again, by their own lack of knowledge. So these things are coming to pass prophetically. They're being taught wrong about it. They're misunderstanding it. They're thinking that they're going to produce the fire from the sky. They're the ones that are going to benefit. They're going to destroy the supposed undesirables, and it's going to be hunky-dory for them there on out. Guess what? It ain't going to be like that, guys, and I'm trying to help you out. They doth not, that doth not understand, shall fall. Though thou, Israel, play the harlot, coming to the moon part, though thou, Israel, play the harlot, very important, yet let not Judah offend, and come not ye unto Gilgal, neither Gilgal. Wow, Gilgal, is that, is that, I have to look into that. I hear Golgotha there. <laughs> but I don't know. But I do feel that it's associated with the hill country of Ephraim. Maybe not. Where the Lord liveth, for Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. We're going to fulfill Rev 12 right here. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Not our father. This Lord is that wickedness that accompanies them in the ephath. This is a connection with this spiritual feeding that he's going to deliver to them in this land of Shinar. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer, produces the understanding of Israel being thy mother, which will connect her as Ishtar, which is associated with the cow. What is a heifer? A heifer is a cow. I'd like you to take a look at something. I got these books spread over all over the place. Let's take a look at one of these backsliding heifers that Israel is from. Because remember, Israel comes out of Egypt. We get Isis, we get Ra, we get El, all within the name. We know that Ephraim comes from Egypt. Joshua was born in Egypt. Manasseh, the northern ten tribes' leader, are of Egyptian royal descendancy. Ishtar is Hathor. Look on Hathor's head as she's feeding this Ankh, this... Uh, immortality which in other words is this knowledge of the sacred serpent to one of these pharaohs who believes himself to be made immortal by this sacred knowledge of the sacred feminine being represented by Hathor with the bull horns on her head which produces her as this cow the heifer that has bared the seed of this sun god Ra which eventually will reveal himself as Enki. And as you can see, all throughout these temples, there is Hathor, and she is continually being depicted the same way. She is the cow. Israel is, as you see, a backsliding heifer. Very important, because then this fulfills the understanding how Washington, D.C. has the greatest monument of Egypt as this obelisk of Ra that we see uh, right there as the main monument. This fulfills the English Ephraimite founder as seeing themselves as this royal Egyptian descendancy as is portrayed in all their symbolism and ritual. This would fulfill Revelation 11, where they have produced this graveyard, this gate. Babylon actually means the gate city. And then now we know that the two towers representing the Lich Gate of Golgotha are what they have produced as the sacrificial place of which Jesus Christ was sacrificed. Now Christianity itself and all its believers are fulfilled by Ephraim in this material Babylon, New York City, which is now the destruction that they plan for the entirety of the undesirables the trigger moment, if you will, the flip of the switch. Now listen close. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. We're going to see Jesus Christ's words fulfilled. And then these words are going to fulfill in my drawing again, guys. Because my drawing comes from the guidance of the spirit of truth. And you're going to see this. Just please bear with me just a little longer. 
For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. That's going to fulfill Rev 12. Let me do that right now. Let me do that right now. Rev 12. Israel. Once again, the woman on the moon. I want you to see right here. <clears throat> and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God. Remember, prepared of God. Who is preparing the place? Ephraim, who is working for this fallen Lord. Ephraim has prepared this place. They should feed her. They, they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Remember I said she goes to the moon. All right. Well, there we have Hosea, the seer, telling you exactly how it's going down. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Now, Ephraim is also a lord. He is a lord or the chief lord of the northern tribe of Israel, but he is acting for his lord, this idol that he's joined to. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Their drink is sour. They have committed whoredom continually. Her rulers with shame do love. Give ye. The wind hath bound her up in her wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. A lot to see there, guys. Their drink is sour. Remember, Inki is the Lord of the flowing waters. He represents these abysmal waters. He represents the sea. The biblical interpretation of the sea.